Okay, so what I want to talk about today is uh, diffusion of technology, just so everybody understands. Diffusion of technology, diffusion of innovation, whatever we call it. That means how technology spreads or gets adopted into society, diffuses into the society. Uh, a couple of points before we go into this. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. Now, I've got some question about Turnitin. One just recently that reminded me of this. And that is, uh, when you hand in your assignment in Turnitin, you will get what is called originality report, meaning that Turnitin will go into the database and find, take your text and match it with anything it can find. So this is to deal with plagiarism, people stealing other people's work and turning it in as their own. Now, when you turn this in, you, you will see, this is what I see. Uh, the per this is from the paper last year. So the, on the top, there's a person that has 2% sim similarity. That's really low. You should have some similarity. Uh, because uh, if you think about it, you're taking, you're writing about topics that are similar to has been written before. So it's probably going to maths. Um, not perhaps the whole sentence, but part of a sentence. And even if you have references, if you cite a book at the end in a bibliography, somebody else has done that also. So you have a match. So 2% is very low. 5 6% is fine. It's very, very normal. Even up to 21%, 30%, it can't be normal because you're using other people's work. You, of course, are referencing this, saying, I took this... And here's a quote from this great speech that I want to share. I want to put it in the paper. And it's so good that you don't want to reword it in your own ways. Because that it's, it is this speech that is good. So you want to put it in and you make a reference. This is from this source. And of course it's going to turn up in, in here. So if you have like 10, you know, it's not too bad. When it gets bad, the colors will change, like in this case. Now, the green guys are still okay, the yellow ones maybe. I looked at all the yellow ones and said, well, yeah, yeah, fine, this is good, this is good, even 36% was good. If you do it correctly, if you cite where you took this stuff, it's okay. These are the rules. So you read other people's stuff and you take their material, put it into your paper. Remember how innovation happened? You take other people's stuff, change it a little bit, add on to it, okay, very much normal. What I would find not so normal is the orange ones, 52%. Ah! Here we are into dangerous territory. And I looked at this and the 52% was okay. The 54%, I said to the dean, you take care of it. You take care of this. It's not my problem anymore. The 96% was actually uh, uh, one sentence. It was a mistake. It wasn't a paper. It wasn't, uh, so, so ignore the 96. But the 54% I actually sent to the dean. And uh, it, was, it was a total wrong use of resources. Sorry. No. Well, uh, in this particular case, which I don't want to talk about too much, was there was referencing in some cases, but the paper was basically quotes. A lot of text taken from somewhere else. If you overdo it, that's too much. It's normal to quote, but if 50% of the paper is quotes, that's too much. So um, that went into the plagiarism category. Okay, another thing.
Let's talk about diffusion of technology. Um, so I explained the term, uh, and it means basically how technology, when it has been introduced, first invented by somebody, how it spreads into society. And there are a few interesting uh, points that I want to make about this. Uh, it's a very interesting study. I want to start by looking at three different technologies. Uh, the phonograph. This is a technology that came in 1877, invented by Thomas Edison. This is in his Belno Park here. Uh, and this is for reproduction of, of whatever. Well, I'll, I'll show you what he thought it was for. Betamax. I actually, I actually found a, when I was preparing for lecture, I actually found a, an old picture. I wanted to update this ugly picture. I didn't find anything, but I found an image that says Betamax and chill. <laughs> I mean, people are doing this back then, apparently. And I sent this to my, my, my family, you know. We have a group chat. And my youngest daughter said, what is Betamax? It was, a, it, was a, it was a product that competed with the VHS. Yeah, but she didn't know. She had no idea what this is because she's 15. And this was old. This is just old. You know, you know what this is, yes? Yeah. I only know what it is because I, I watched an anime and had to picture it as a <laughs> Okay. So, so I'm coming to a point where my students don't know what this is. Well, you don't know what phonograph is either. You, you, you've probably seen it, but you have no experience with it. Betamax was a videotape competing with VHS, okay, yeah. And Appalisa. So, three products. Um, question is, what, why are they grouped together? And what's the point here? Because they failed. Because they failed. Well, yes. But what are the customers really buying? So, if you take, let's take the, let's take the, uh, Phonograph. So the phonograph was created by Edison in 1877. Um, and he created this version. It has a cylinder, you can see. Uh, you take a cylinder, you record in the cylinder, and you play back on the cylinder. And then you have this handle to turn to get the music. And it comes out of this. You can use it to input and now output. Now there was a competition. And they used discs. And they became much more popular. Victor Talking Machines Victrola. Victrola. Now, why did they beat Edison? They Sorry? They were cheaper and good and not for the purpose. Yes, but there's one other thing that is really important because you're talking about technology. What are people using it for? And they're using it for this. Listen to this. From its opera, is this? Anybody? Sorry? Okay. And who is singing? La Tone Immobile. Here's the point. What people were really buying was this guy. This is the pop star of the time. And they want to listen to Enrico Caruso because he's the famous pop star, rock star, opera star. Edison, what he did, he just got no names. And he said, music is music, who cares? No, 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 no. They wanted to listen to this guy. So they signed up all the people that were famous and you know popular. Uh, and this, this is why they won. So people wanted to hear these people sing. And that was clever. That was clever. Edison, on the other hand, he was asked in a newspaper, New York Times, 
77 or 78. And he was asked to give a list of what can you do with a phonograph. And the first thing was letter writing, all kinds of dictation, phonographic books. I mean, with, that which will speak to blind people. You know, I, I use a lot of audio books. I use audio books. It works for me, you know. <laughs> the teaching of evolution, uh, reproduction music, I don't know what that is. Music box number six. And look at the number five, the last words of the dying person. So, Grandpa, you're dying. Say something. <laughs> Clocks that will tell you what time it is. We don't have that even. To. So, here's an inventor, brilliant guy, uh, that's trying to come up with solutions to this new invention. Uh, the solution was, of course, music for, by famous people. So, this is why. And another thing also that did the. Um, Another thing also was the this. Uh, Edison actually had better quality. That's what they say. But discs are, I mean, you cannot stack cylinders. That's stupid. This is why X should be, you know, flat. But you they're not. Stack them if you like, like yeah, this. yeah. It, it's, it's more difficult. But uh, you can even print pictures on this cover for this. So that was the conclusion. Consumers wanted their favorite singers, and the discs were more convenient. OK, let's go to the Betamax. Why did they, they fail? They were also really expensive. Yes? I heard they were ruled out of the market by not Sony, but different industries, JVC or something. Some producers, uh, they decided to have the VHS and to rule out the beta. Mm -hmm. I heard some stories. And yes, the answer is obvious. I, I, from what I know, it was a smaller tape. Yeah, people. it was. It was. It was small. They didn't get enough people producing beta max pictures, did they? No. Nobody gonna mention the porn industry. Yeah. And, and, uh, that's always the first time. I, I mean, they usually that ah, the porn industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Porn industry selected VHS because the, the competitor. Because Betamax said, you know, we don't want any of that stuff here. Uh, did Betamax have better quality? Yes, they did. They have better quality, and they they have been used. Uh, I think very recently, the TV stations in Iceland stopped using them for their internal stuff. So it has been. They have been producing the tape for a long time. Uh, there was another issue, licensing issue. But the real reason to begin with is what you mentioned. The Betamax tape stamped up originally was 60 minutes. And how long are movies? One and a half, two hours. Yes. So people wanted to record movies. And 60 minutes, you have to t switch tapes. I mean, the movie is not going to stop. You have to switch tapes. You, you lose something. So two hours, that was, you know, even, even, even if it's worse quality, uh, people said, you know, two hours, that's bad that deal. Betamax would eventually become uh, longer, three, four hours. But initially, that was, the, that was the thing. And the porn issue was also <laughs> probably a good explanation. So customer wanted to record the movies, legal issues. Uh, and of course, we have to keep this on record. Now, the Lisa. That was also a failure. Uh, today, this is antique. I mean, if you had one of these, uh, I mean, you could sell it for. But this is, um, let me just go through this. Development started in 78. And I will talk about this when I, when I talk about the, uh, the graphical user interface. Basically, Steve Jobs went to uh, visit to Xerox Parks, came back with the notion of desktop metaphor office-like environment for working on your personal computer. Released in 83, and it failed. And the reason it failed is very simple. Uh, it had, I mean, it even, even had preemptive multitasking operating system with graphical user. It had everything. And uh, the, the com competition at the time was Microsoft DOS, command line, you know, crap operating system that you could place on a diskette, you know, small one. So with this, it was just too expensive. And 
they, it was very much expensive, and also they were on the edge of the technology. The hardware wasn't ready, but they scaled it down a little bit, and in 84, they managed to create the Macintosh. But the development of this started, as you can see, way earlier. So the components they had, they were expensive, big, but it was just adjacent possible. That was what it is. And, it, and next year, they could do it. And the vision was right. Technology was not there, and it had too many features. They were trying to do so much in this. The Macintosh version was scaled down, less features, and that worked better. So the point here is we're building things. The inventors are trying to build things, but they don't understand the uh, customer motivations all the time. Uh, and they can't be buying it for the totally different reasons. And let me give you one example. And I talked about this before. So this is Apple II. Uh, a lot of people bought this, mainly universities. Uh, and then when it went into business, no, no business person wanted to buy this. They had Microsoft DOS. But then it started to sell, and it was because of this software. And like I said earlier, the people would go buy these machines, read the manual, go to a, a course, training, go through all the pain of using this just to learn how to use VisiCal. And this saved people a lot of time with plans, accounting, and a lot of stuff. So it was um, VisiCal that, that changed this. So this is the easy part if you think about it. Uh, but this one, the social, organizational, cultural things, that's the difficult thing. And we see it today because we have today internet smartphones. We have VR, machine intelligence, Internet of Things. All of these things are here. And people are slowly starting to build on top of it. This is why we are going through this digital transformation decade. And let me show you a few innovations that are going to do this change. And we can start with this one. You may have seen this. This is one of the Google propaganda videos. first time this guy sits behind a wheel, steering wheel of a car, and there's a good reason for that. Because he's blind. So we're at the point where this is turning into, uh, this is being allowed in many states uh, in the US. But they will start slowly because this needs regulatory change. Uh, but if you think about it, if you can, you know, transform the car, do you need to own a car? You just have your phone and get one, and something will show up. So drinking and driving, maybe that will be okay in the future. <laughs> So blind guy. Uh, so self-driving car, and if you and if if you would look at the number, what's the number one employment in many of the U.S. states? Very much to the top are drivers, truck drivers, drivers in general. So that's gonna have a huge impact, uh, but it might take time. The technology still needs to improve a lot. I predicted that this would be probably 2020 plus. And they even haven't tried, you know, in the snow. I haven't seen one in snow driving a mountain road. I actually found another video uh, about this. Introducing the all-new self-driving car. Maybe this is what will happen. driving for you, so you can catch up on the more important things in life. It automatically takes the right turns. Unexpected 
obstacles. I think people are, you know, so much aware of self-driving cars. Oh, it's been talked about a lot, so I, I'm not going to assume this is going to happen. Okay, self-driving car, that's a technology th that is going to have huge impact on, on job market. This one will more so, robotics. Now, if you think about robots in the 20th century, they're just industrial robots. They're just machines, huge machines that build cars and stuff like that. Okay, <laughs> and uh, if you walk in there, the robot is going to kill you if, you if you're in the way, because it doesn't see you. It just moves the arm and does the same thing repeatedly. And this has been optimized so we can build cars that are really affordable, even if they're high-tech piece of st thing. The robots today, they're different. They understand space, so they have the capacity to see, to hear, to understand what you're saying. You can tell them to stop. You can tell them to go faster, slow down. And you can train them. You can take the robot arm and say, hey, pick up this stuff here and put it into this box. And then when your box is full, you wait, and we get a new box, OK? Here's an example of a robot. It doesn't move. You just put it somewhere. It costs $2,000, at least it did couple of years ago. And this is changing business. Meet Baxter. Baxter is Rethink Robotics' flagship product in a revolutionary new category of robots with common sense. Baxter is a low-cost and highly adaptive robot for manufacturing applications and is so easy to use that non-technical workers can train it. Baxter increases workforce productivity so that factories can compete with low-cost offshore labor. And Rethink Robotics practices what it preaches. Our robots are made in America. Baxter can do manufacturing tasks like material handling, line loading and unloading, test and sort, machine tending, packing and unpacking, light assembly, and finishing operations. Baxter is a complete system requiring no integration. It can be uncrated and doing useful work in under an hour. While traditional manufacturing robots need to be programmed by expensive technical professionals, Baxter can be trained by non-technical personnel. Train Baxter to do a new task by just showing it what to do. No application software or teach pendant is required. So the people working with Baxter get a promotion from working on repetitive mundane tasks to supervising robots that do them. Baxter has a suite of integrated sensors and the common sense to work intelligently. It adapts to the speed of the conveyor and variation in part placement and does human scale tasks at human cadence. So unlike traditional automation, there's no need to redesign your workflow to accommodate Baxter. Baxter safely operates elbow to elbow with people its unique compliant mechanical architecture lets Baxter give on contact. Baxter is an extensible platform like a PC or smartphone. You get regular software updates with new capabilities. Baxter is showing up everywhere, at small manufacturing firms that couldn't previously afford robots, and at large firms, rethinking processes that weren't previously economical to automate. Rethink manufacturing. Rethink offshoring. Rethink robotics. So this is changing, uh, having impact already. And we are seeing jobs that went to, that were outsourced to Asia, migrating back to the Western world, in particular into the States. Um, now the discussion is always, is this going to el eliminate jobs? It will eliminate jobs, but there's a new thing here that was in this video, the person was actually working with the robot. So all of these technologies, when you talk about replacing, 
Maybe they're not so much replacing. Maybe they're just making each worker more productive. And these robots, they're getting so productive that uh, in, in the southern states of, uh, of the US, where they do the cotton, uh, the cotton industry used to move to Kazakhstan and, and to Euro East Europe and Asia, where there was cheap labor. Today it's moved back because the cotton fibers are made by machines and everything's automated. And the fiber is much better with these machine mates than with people. So now the poor people in those countries, they're losing their job because of machines in the southern state of the US. So that came back. I had a video on MOOCs. Also, you know what that is? Uh, I hope it's not that long. Every few seconds, the ticker on the Coursera website moves up as 70,000 new students a week enroll in courses like human-computer interaction, introduction to astronomy, and modern poetry, all offered by top-tier universities. I've been teaching a class similar to this at Duke for 10 years, and I'm excited about the opportunity to offer it to many more students through this online venue. Welcome to the brave new world of massive open online courses, known as MOOCs, a tool for democratizing higher education. OK, I'm going to stop this. Um, taking all these courses, putting them online, uh, and this is just the beginning, but this is making it possible for anybody to sign up to courses and take them. Now, what is missing is the degree. Remember the degree. You can take all the courses in Stanford, but you don't get a degree from Stanford. They're not going to give you a, a diploma. Uh, well, maybe they will. Maybe, maybe your CV will be a database, as I talked about earlier, where all the courses you take get registered, all the YouTube TED Talks, everything gets registered in the database, and we can, uh, can just use that instead of a degree. Business models of universities is changing. Universities are changing into real estate companies anyway. OK, it's so the Snap generation. You, many of you know how, what Snapchat is. Um, Keep 
Let's take a break, and after the break, I will tell you why Snapchat is important and why it works. <laughs>